me. So good morning, everybody. Oh, oh afternoon. Sorry, it's afternoon, everybody. Um, before we start, I will do some. So good afternoon, everybody. My name is Sarah Doucette and welcome to our Zoo View today. Anna will be our producer and Amy is standing in the rain down at the zoo. So we are, the three of us, are directors of Friends of High Park Zoo and we are thrilled. This is our first Zoo View actually since the zoo reopened to the public. So it's absolutely amazing. Quick update, the zoo is open from 11 in the morning till seven at night. Please enter by the gates up near the Grenadier restaurant. You go down one side of the, the, uh, the roadway, you turn around, do a U-turn at the bottom, and you can only exit from the same gateway. Uh, we ask people to do social distancing. Masks aren't mandatory, but if it is fairly crowded as it was yesterday, please do um, use your mask. So now I am going to introduce you to Amy, who is at the zoo on this damp day, and she is there with the zookeepers. Amy, do we have any yaks we can talk to today? Over to we you. do. Thanks, Sarah. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Amy. As Sarah said, I'm on the board and we are doing our next zoo view down at the zoo. And actually a perfect day to do it because people who might have wanted to come out today are a little put off by the rain. So we're bringing the zoo to you at home. And I am here with Sonia, one of our zookeepers, and she is going to introduce us to our resident yaks. So this is Sonia. Good morning. Hey, Good afternoon. Good afternoon. <laughs> All right. So I'll introduce you to our yaks. We have behind me here is Onyx. Um, he is our bull. He is uh, five years old now. He was actually born here at the zoo. And um, as you can see, he's resting comfortably. He's not a big fan of the rain. So he's in there enjoying the quiet as well. And we also have our girl over here. Her name is Aria. And she is about nine years old. And uh, she's enjoying her own shelter too. Sometimes they huddle together and sometimes they hang out on their own. So, um, Onyx, I could say, has a little bit of attitude. So I can see why Aria would want to be hanging out on her own and not always be with him. He is quite um, vocal at times. He is very bossy kind of guy. And um, he does get worked up a little bit when the bison across the road start playing with their toys. So he'll actually stand in the corner that's opposite from the bison and he starts huffing and puffing and he makes a lot of noise, grunting and, and uh, all that kind of stuff. Sometimes he works over the fence with his horns a little bit just to let the guys across the road know that he's there and he's a big boy too. So he does a lot of that. And he also does a lot of talking with his neighbor Fergus, who is the Highland cow bull. Um, he actually has put a hole in the fence between him and, and Fergus that we've patched up and he's ripped a hole in it again. <laughs> he has taken a gate apart uh, between the two of them at one time. Um, so yeah, he can be pretty um, ornery sometimes. So we do our best to just kind of let him do his thing and we work around him. But in general, he's a pretty handsome boy. We kind of like him. You know, he's, he moves along kind of nice and slow and um, we stay on his good side and he's, he's good to us too. <laughs> well, thank you, Sonia. Thank you so much for the introduction. And I'm gonna turn it back to Sarah now to introduce our expert so we can learn all about Yax. Thank you so much. I, I didn't know that Onyx was um, so interactive with the bison. It must be quite interesting actually uh, to see Maybe if Jasper, uh, is it bull bison, male bison, um, is, uh, you know, saying, hey, this is my territory. You stay in your own area. Anyway, thank you, Amy, and thank you, Sonia. Um, those two shelters uh, were purchased a couple of years ago by Friends of High Park Zoo because the yaks needed more space, and now I really understand why. <laughs> so <laughs> thank you. So today we are absolutely thrilled to have with us Dr. Peter Hansen. He is a professor of history and the director of international and global studies at Worcester Polytechnic Institute located in Massachusetts. In his role, 
Dr. Hansen's responsibilities include enhancing the curriculum component for the Polytechnic, uh, global programs, exploring new partnerships, um, advising students in global projects, international and global studies bring together the faculties of arts and science and business. And the, the global school uh, to enrich students' experiences of global engagement on the campus and around the world. So today, Dr. Hansen will be speaking about YAKS and their importance from the historical perspective. So Dr. Hansen, thank you so much for joining us. I hope you have a beautiful afternoon where you are rather than a miserable one we're experiencing. Um, I hand it over to you. Thank you very much. I'm delighted to be here and it's turned out to be a nice sunny day where I am. <laughs> we were expecting um, bad weather. I'm going to see if I can share a screen, which you should be able to see a um, PowerPoint. If you cannot, someone flag that <clears throat> for me. No, we can see it just fine. Wait Excellent. Thank you. So, um, as was just said, I want to give you some historical perspective on YAKS, and you'll see that some of the characteristics you just heard about for YAKS that are at the High Park Zoo are things that have been remarked on for a long time about yaks. Um, here's a, a yak in Nepal. Um, and uh, I'll just note these sort of uh, dyed uh, pieces of yak hair that are on the bolt because we'll see this um, a little while um, in other contexts. So yaks have been a, a fascinating creature for people around the world since antiquity. On the third century, Alien, in a book about animals, uh, a compendium, described a, a plant-eating animal with a bushy tail that hides its tail in some thicket, faces about, and stands waiting for its pursuers and plucks up its courage, fancying that since its tail is not visible, it will no longer be seem worthy of pursuing, for it knows that its beauty resides in its tail. So it's tails and it's horns and it's the character of the yaks have been something people have commented on for a long time. Yak tails in particular uh, were status symbols and uh, used as practical objects as fly whisks. Uh, as you can see on the right, there's a, two examples of fly whisks from the British Museum. One on the top of very contemporary one made than the last um, decades. In the bottom, uh, an older one, these are simply used by whoever is holding the handle to flick around their uh, body to move the flies away. Um, on the left, you see a painting uh, from of the Mughal Emperor Babur in the 16th century, who is uh, anointing these yak tails that are on standards, that are on kind of poles that would be taken, uh, carried by uh, an army um, into battle. You can see some of his, uh, mu uh, the, the band, the musicians for the army up here on camels. And down in the lower left, there's a, an ordinary cow. Um, but the yak tails, these were being anointed um, with uh, mare's milk to kind of have a sacramental uh, object that they would carry with them. And yak tails were used by the, Mo the Mongols, um, dyed red to, or to ornament bonnets, uh, hats, and or worn off the ears of elephants. Um, this has gone on for centuries. In the 18th century, you really get the classification in uh, kind of Linnaean systems of the grunting ox and Bosgruniens, the name for the, the yak formally. And it's most, this is Thomas Pennant's history of quad, quadrupeds from the 18th century, 1780s. Her marks on its tails, which are long flowing hairs like that of a beautiful mare, most elegant silky texture and of a glossy silvery color. And there's one pre preserved in the British Museum, not less than six feet long. And you can see here's an example, as it happens from the British Museum, of a dyed 
uh, yak tail. This is the kind that was used where this piece at the top is actually stuck in the ear of the animal uh, and it dangles out and it keeps track of which one's which. And the other descriptions of the yak by Pennant describe their fierce nature. And this was, I was reminded of this listening to the uh, uh, zookeepers talk about your current yaks who have a fierce nature, they said, particularly when irritated the sight of red or any gay colors. Rising anger is perceived by the shaking of their bodies, raising and moving of their tails and the menacing looks in their eyes. Their attacks are so sudden, so rapid, that it's very difficult to avoid them. The wild breed is very tremendous and in that chase, the hunt of it, they're not, if they're not slain on the spot, they grow so furious, they will pursue the assailant and if they are overtake him, never desist tossing him on their horns in the air as long as life remains. So these are the characteristics that yaks have been associated with uh, going back some time. In the late 18th century, Warren Hastings, who was governor general of Bengal, um, requested that some yaks be brought from the Himalayas to him in Calcutta to add to his menagerie in Alipur, a neighborhood of Calcutta where he lived, um, where he had yaks and goats from the Himalayas and even a tortoise, um, that was born about set, born about 1750 called Adwaita died in 2006 in the Calcutta Zoo uh, from the Seychelles Islands. I asked just before the presentation, and yaks apparently um, might reach 25 to 30 years of age, um, not as long as that tortoise, which was more than 250 years old when it died. Hastings also brought, brought yaks to England, to Europe. Um, after he retired as governor general, he returned and was put on trial. Uh, he was in a long impeachment trial uh, that lasted for seven years. But in this time, he uh, had it, bought a country house. And as you'll see in this portrait of one of his homes, there's a portrait of the yak. Um, he brought his yaks from India to England. One of them died en route. The female yak died, but the bull survived and became uh, the most famous yak of all time, probably. Certainly the model of a yak for the rest of the, uh, most of the well, next 50 years, at least, uh, most of the 19th century. This is a painting of uh, Hastings yak made by George Stubbs in the 1790s. Um, Stubbs was known for painting of many paintings of animals, especially horses. Um, and here you see a, an image of the yak in its native habitat. This is probably from Bhutan. In, this is certainly in Bhutan, which is probably where his yak came from. This is the, a known place called the Palace of Great Happiness in Bhutan. And you'll see just under, sort of underneath the nose of the yak, the Bhutan turnip, which... Um, Hastings admired very much and brought with him back to England and to cultivate in his English garden. This yak uh, had its image in prints and circulated widely. The, the portrait, the painting was copied uh, by Stubbs and exhibited in Leicester Square in a cabinet of curiosities and museum. But this, this yak was also well known because when it returned to, or not returned, when it was shipped to England, it, uh, was missing its, uh, the female yak, and it had a nail in its horn that when it was in the same enclosure as a horse, uh, it actually gored the horse um, because it got angry at the horse. And so the, from then on, the yak was kept in separate uh, enclosures from all the other animals. This was the beginning of many yaks and many zoos and many um, yak enclosures um, in Europe, especially in Paris at the uh, um, Jardin d'Acclimatation, um, the zoo in the Bois de Boulogne, uh, where there are still, I think, some yaks in their exhibits. There was a group of 12 yaks sent from China to Paris in 1854. These are probably some of those. Antwerp had a very large yak enclosure. This is from the 1880s. 
And so it's um, some of these yaks were sent to the Alps to try to acclimatize them for agricultural use, uh, which didn't work that well. Um, the yaks are then really kind of domesticated in the European imagination. Here's a, a poem about the yak from Hilaire Belloc's Child, The Bad Child's Book of Beasts. The yak, as a friend to the children, commend me the yak. You will find it exactly the thing. It will carry and fetch. You can ride on its back or lead it about with a string. Hopefully these uh, sketches come out in, on the uh, sharing of the screen on Zoom. The Tartar who dwells in the plains of Tibet, a desolate region of snow, has for centuries made it a nursery pet, and surely the Tartar should know. Then tell your papa where the yak can be got, and if he is awfully rich, he will buy you the creature, or else he will not. I cannot be positive which. So the yak becomes the st standard figure in the, you know, why is for yak type genre of the children learning their alphabet uh, by the turn of the century. And it is used in military uh, places in, um, in the Himalayas, which has happened, you know, for, for quite some time. The British invasion of Tibet in 1904 is though uh, infamous for its use of yaks. They invaded with about 3,500 and they added another thousand yaks while they were in Tibet, but the British did not provide any forage for them. And uh, Tibet is a fairly uh, arid uh, environment, not much food to forage on your own. So when the expedition ended, they had fewer than 200 yaks in their body, which in the bottom of the screen says Percival Landon, one of the people involved. It was one of the dreariest histories of the waste of animal life and military records. After that though, the British learned how to use, how to provide forage and uh, yaks served uh, as the beasts of burden on all of the Everest expeditions from the 1920s and 1930s uh, through, that went through Tibet and helped them to reach base camp, to um, reach the higher elevations. Um, Tenzing Norgay and Edmund Hillary complete the first ascent of Everest in 1953, which is notable in this context because Tenzing, who was from the region around Everest, had been a yak herder as a young boy. Um, so I have some images to show you to kind of um, bring this up to the present to give you a sense of uh, the yak's use in more contemporary times. Um, this is in the Kumbu region of Nepal, just below Mount Everest. Um, and these are yaks carrying um, local go goods really from one city to another. They're mostly used though, to carry the goods, the bags of the tourists, of the trekkers, the climbers. And these are yaks in Namche Bazaar being loaded up with the duffel bags of uh, a trekking group that I was in. Um, and each bag is put in these little uh, sacks. So because I was told, um, if you just put the bag straight up on the yak, it smells really like the yak, uh, like yak hair. Um, and this way it protects it, keeps it a little cleaner. And this is loaded and unloaded every day as you journey through the area. Um, forage, since I mentioned it before, is intriguing because here you actually have a person who's carrying the hay that's the food for the yaks. Um, and the trekkers carry their or day pack, something that carries what they need for the day, and the yaks carry the, um, the larger bags. Here a couple of yaks are going slow across this bridge, holding up the group, and you have the forage being carried again by person and in part here uh, by yak. Um, as you go up towards uh, closer to Mount Everest, the yaks are still the main um, way that all the, all the supplies go in. Uh, and you're on the same track. The yaks pretty much just follow the path. There's a, somebody who's 
helping keep them to the path, but more or less they find their way on their own as they go up um, higher into the mountains. At daily, you get this unloading, unloading. Um, and as you get closer and approach base camp, here's a, some yaks coming back with goods leaving there and others coming in to the uh, cirque that's for base camp. And there, here you can see some goods coming in, the tents, um, the, the climbers then leave from this point and go up to the right up the Kumbu Icefall. And here are like uh, gas containers for cooking. Everything goes in or comes out, including all the human waste on the back of a yak. Um, here's some coming out, leaving, and I'll just leave us with whoops, this uh, final shot of the Kumbu Glacier as uh, you can see the string of yaks coming in um, with all the goods and materiel that are needed. And here we are back at the High Park Zoo with our, uh, I assume this might be Onyx, who is uh, an impressive yak that fits the image that we've learned about yaks for the last couple thousand years. So with that, I'll stop sharing and um, can have take time for questions or discussion. There may be ways to ask the uh, zookeeper something through Amy, but thank you very much. Thank you so much. I, I guess, I mean, I see, you know, documentaries on um, climbers going up Mount Everest, but I'd never really thought about how everything got there. I thought the Sherpas were carrying everything, but actually it's the yaks carrying, which makes much more sense. It's both. I mean, as you can see, there were some people carrying things in one of the shots. I didn't dwell on them, but um, yeah, for anything heavy, it's um, in larger groups, the, uh, the yaks are carrying it all because it's uh, cheaper, but they have, it, you reach a certain point and they have to carry all the food for the yaks up with them too. Yeah, yeah true, true. Um, yeah. Anna, do we have any questions? If not, I have some, but uh, do we have any or? I think you can ask yours. I mean, my, I, I have one question I'd like to ask and that's okay. really, um, you know, you talked about how the yaks were kind of brought to Europe via maybe Hastings was kind of the instrumental person to bring it across. But prior to the invasion of Tibet, I mean, were yaks used in any other sort of military purpose or um, it's really any sort of semi-industrial way other than, I mean, they've always been a beast of burden, I guess, uh, for their local community, but were they used for, for, um, for anything on a larger scale? Um, within the Himalayas, yes. Outside of it, no. I mean, um, the kind of uh, Himalayan trading, that is people taking goods across the mountains that would have happened on the backs of yaks. Um, but it's in smaller groups than the Young Husband Expedition that we made in Tibet or the Everest Expeditions in the 1920s, uh, which are going for long periods of time and bringing a lot of stuff with them. Um, but Himalayan trade, um, bringing things from one part to another, that's where they were used. That was the closest thing to kind of industrial use. Um, the they were definitely in use throughout the 19th century and before for that sort of activity. Uh, the Mongols might have used them um, as part of their military um, activities, you know, going back from the 14th century onwards, but alongside other horses and uh, mules and um, other animals like that. I mean, with, but within the Him Himalayas, and I didn't talk about this, uh, Yaks are domestic um, and not just beast of burden. So they're providing milk uh, that's used to make um, cheese, to make um, yak milk tea. It's sort of heated and um, yet, yeah, or butter uh, comes from yak milk. Um, so there's also the hair, um, the hides, the meat, uh, 
I mean, if you were to go to that region, the, the meat that's available is probably chicken that's imported or yak. They may well be imported as well uh, because they don't tend to kill the uh, yaks up in the uh, national park area where, where Everest sits. Um, so there's, they can be, um, it's not like the way you can have some sacred cows as it were in parts of India, but there are some uh, ritual um, roles for, for yaks. In the Everest region, there's a festival called Mani Rimdu, which ha happens annually, which a, um, one of the features of the ceremonies, which lasts for a couple weeks, is that a particular yak is identified and um, kind of uh, anointed with butter or oil and, and released into the hills. Uh, it will no longer be a beast of burden. It's a kind of ritual, um, free, not a sacrifice in the sense of killing, but of uh, releasing into freedom of, of uh, you know, a, a release from an obligation to provide any labor or milk or anything where the yak is um, free. I guess the question is when they release the yak, is there enough food for it to eat on the mountain? <laughs> the regions where they do this, yes. I mean, okay, good. There's, there's plants, and, um, <laughs> you know, uh, trees, rhododendron, and all mm -hmm. kinds of. Uh, pasturage, uh, grasses, and whatever. Um, it's, you get higher in elevation, and that's where everything, mm. um, it's just less, you don't have those things. They're not in enough quantity to sustain the large numbers of people, the large number of yaks that come up. So when you, were, it sounds like you went to base camp, did you, for uh, base camp? Were you climbing, or were you just there to no. watch the yaks? <laughs> uh, I was there to watch the climbers um, okay. for a uh, good bonus um, but uh, and, and to see the mountain um, I mean um, that was the main uh, attraction main event um, so uh, yeah excellent there were beautiful photographs beautiful okay. photographs that's why I showed them I thought it might uh, oh yeah Give you a yeah. taste of the area. Yeah. So I, I love the idea that the yak used to be called, what was it, the grunting ox? Was that before right. it was called a yak and then they defined it as something different? Or That's the European classifying imagination. Um, I mean, it was a yak uh, or variations when it's local language, you know, of its name. Um, but when you compare it to other uh, types of bison, oxen, how do they all relate to one another? Well, they, they try to figure that out and say, these are the boxes that everybody fits in. And um, yeah, it was the grunting ox it was the kind of- I love it. Anglicized name for the yak. <laughs> um, and which you can still find in some kind of, uh, you know, zoological dictionaries or lists of people, but it, mm -hmm. it's kind of archaic. I don't think people really use that anymore. Yeah. I do have to just ask one more question about the tail. Uh, mm -hmm. They trim the tail to get the, the hair, don't they? So the yak can walk away with a short tail and come back another year and produce more hair. Is that accurate? I assume so. But my knowledge on that, you know, the, the implementation of how they get the hair and so forth is mm -hmm. probably not any better than yours. But I would think, yes, in yeah. the way people grow out hair, you know, and cut it off to give to charity. Um, that's what happens to the yak, except they don't have any say in the matter. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, um, but the yaks, they, I mean, they have long hair. Mm -hmm. it, even in the last shot of the, the yak at the High Park Zoo, I mean, um, the descriptions going way back, they'll describe this creature which has hair that is nearly touches the ground underneath all of it. But the long tail, because it was so soft and um, it was valued for that reason. Um, and, um, you know, like uh, Hastings had uh, some goats brought back from the Himalayas that could produce pashmina wool. Mm -hmm. 
mm-hmm. they didn't do this in Calcutta. I mean, they, they didn't thrive in really in the much hotter lowland climate um, as they would and, and do higher up where it's cooler. Um, but yeah, they uh, have been admired for the, for a long time. Well, thank you so much. Thank I you. have learned so much about yaks. I mean, I love going down to the zoo and seeing Onyx and Ariano and I, you know, exactly. They're big shaggy, you know, animals with, you know, as you say, probably fur almost touching the ground. They're absolutely stunning. And, to, but to know they've been working animals, I think is, is fascinating. So thank you so much for joining us today. Really appreciate this. I think we've all learned a lot today. Um, I just want to comment that if anyone has missed our previous zoo views, you can watch them on Friends of High Park Zoo YouTube channel. And this recording from today will be uh, posted in the next week or so. Our next zoo view, uh, because it's summertime, we're sort of spreading them out a little bit, will actually be on August the 14th, again at 1 p.m. And we will have guests from Colborne Lodge who will be coming to talk to us about some history in High Park. They may give us some history on the zoo as well. So on that note, um, I don't think we're going back to the zoo because it's been raining, Um, but I wanted to thank Amy and Sonia for being there standing in the rain. We appreciate that. Uh, Dr. Hansen, thank you so much for joining us and your presentation was, was amazing. As I say, I learned a lot and I'm sure everyone else did. So on that note, have a wonderful afternoon. Um, It's, almost stop raining and uh, enjoy and we hope to see you back here on August the 14th. Thanks everyone. Thank you very much. It was wonderful. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you.